Chapter 2 The Imam and the Gun Who would you guess is the toughest sort of Muslim to reach? A terrorist? Perhaps. Anyone willing to blow himself up to kill infidels seems as committed to Islam as they come, right? That would be a reasonable speculation, of course. But I know of former terrorists walking with Jesus now in every Middle Eastern country. We work with many of them to reach other Muslims with the gospel. This new breed of disciples has been changed radically for Christ. The presence of the Holy Spirit is so strong in their lives, you would never suspect their shady pasts when you first meet them. These former terrorists are Exhibit A when it comes to the transforming power of Christ. Suicide bombers are tough, but as I see it, the hardest Muslims to reach are the imams. An imam is the leader of the local mosque. His job is to keep the Muslim flock in line with the Quran. These spiritual leaders are steeped in Islamic teaching and propaganda. As the guardians of Islam, imams live to defend their religion at all costs, usually the cost of the life of anyone who dares to convert to Christianity. So when someone shares Christ with them, imams are usually combative, angry, and arrogant. While a few of them have a softer demeanor, most retain the jagged personal edge necessary to coerce Muslims into submission on a daily basis. Muslims usually fear the imams because of the enormous power they wield within the community. If they live in a country where Sharia law has been adopted, then imams, along with the religious police, are the enforcers. When Muslims come to Christ, converts often liken imams to the religious leaders who threaten Jesus in the New Testament. Think Pharisee with the Quran in his hand, and you have the picture. In Egypt, imams seem to be everywhere, and there's a good reason for that. Egypt is the intellectual center of Islam. An imam who studied at Egypt's Al-Azhar University, just down the street from the marketplace where Kamal met Noor, is respected throughout the Islamic world. In many ways, Egypt, and specifically Cairo, is the hub of the religion. Al-Azhar was founded in A.D. 970 and claims to be the world center for Arabic literature and Sunni Islamic learning. In Mecca and Medina, Saudi Arabia may have the two holiest sites of Islam, but Egypt shapes the religion. Saudi Arabia is the heart of Islam. Egypt is the brains. It makes a great place for Jesus to visit. Imams the Word Hassan startled awake to a rough hand clamped firmly over his mouth. Heart racing, he felt the cold muzzle of a gun in his right temple. Don't say a word. A masked voice whispered the command in the dark, Get up and come with me. For several minutes, Hassan rubbed sleep from his eyes as his kidnapper shoved him through the streets of Cairo's old city. Hassan had no doubt he had been discovered as one who leads Muslims to faith in Christ. Despite his best efforts to evangelize quietly, one convert at a time, Cairo had found him out. It was one of the riskiest places in the world for Muslim evangelism. Hassan had moved to this section of old Cairo two years earlier, Gifted at bringing Jesus into conversations with Muslim friends, he had yet to see anyone in this neighborhood become a Christ follower, but he had tried daily. Stumbling through one quiet block after another with a gun to his back, Hassan cried out to God, Isn't anyone awake to help me? But two hours before the morning call to prayer, Cairo still slept. Not that anyone would care, of course. An imam pushing a Christian through this place wouldn't garner any sympathy for the victim. They would assume, as Hassan did just now, that he was on his way to a well-deserved execution. The rough grip on Hassan's right arm shoved him along quickly, jerking him intermittently for course corrections deemed necessary by his captor. As his death march progressed, Hassan's thoughts drifted to his rapidly concluding mission here in Egypt. He studied Islam for years, learning the Quran, the Hadith, which are the sayings of Muhammad, compiled several centuries after his death, and the teaching of most leading Islamic scholars, all for the purpose of knowing the beliefs of Muslims whom he had hoped God would transform into brothers and sisters in Christ.
The Lord had birthed a passion in Hassan to reach Muslims, but all of his preparation didn't matter, it seemed, on his way to becoming another Egyptian martyr. Up the stairs, the harsh voice interrupted Hassan's musings. Hassan wondered how a secret had been revealed, and by whom. Blood pounded in his veins from fear and the exertion of a five-story climb up the steps of an aging building with his captor. We have to jump off this building onto the roof of the other one over there. It's the only way to get in. For the first time since leaving his apartment, Hassan looked squarely at his abductor's face. Only then did he realize the man had blackened his face to obscure his features. Hassan glanced into the gaping space at which the man now pointed his gun and then stared back at the intense eyes gleaming from the dark visage. There's no way I can jump from this building to that one, Hassan blurted. You can, and you will. Get a running start. His captor pointed the muzzle at Hassan. You go first. Whether death would come from a bullet or a fall to the pavement fifty feet below, Hassan didn't know, but he believed his companion would use his weapon with the slightest provocation. At least the jump, even if it failed, would extend his life a few more seconds. And if he made it across the gap, who knows what might yet save him. Adrenaline. An angel's, perhaps, yielded the most magnificent leap of Hassan's life. He landed with room to spare, and his obviously practiced kidnapper thumped beside him, pistol still in his hand, two seconds later. The assailant seized Hassan's right arm and forced him toward a hatchway in the abandoned warehouse. Hassan was sure that he would never again see the night sky. He whispered, Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. The man flinched almost imperceptibly at Hassan's prayer. Hassan noticed the fleeting cut of the man's eyes toward him. The grip on Hassan's arm tightened. Open the hatch door and climb in quickly. The gun again pointed the way. Hassan saw himself struggle through the opening as if he were an actor in a movie thriller. He hoped the scene wouldn't end too quickly, and once inside the gloomy structure, the plot took a startling twist. He recounts what happened over the next several incredible minutes. I stepped into a foreboding room, lit with a single candle, fully expecting my immediate execution. Ten obviously Muslim men stood in a circle and stared at me as I entered. They ordered me to sit down. When I complied, the menacing atmosphere changed instantly. The mysterious group smiled at me. The man who had kidnapped Hassan spoke first. We are imams, and we all studied at Al-Azhar University. During our time there, each of us had a dream about Jesus, and each of us has privately become a follower of Christ. For a time, we didn't dare tell anyone about this. It would, of course, been our own death sentences. But finally, we could hide it no longer. We each prayed to Jesus for his help to learn what it means to be his follower. Over time, he brought us together, and you can imagine our amazement when the Holy Spirit revealed that there are other imams who have found Jesus as well. Now we meet here three times a week at night to pray for our families and for the people in our mosques to find Jesus too. We know you are a follower of Christ. He led us to you. Hassan recalls, I was speechless. Then I was so relieved. I laughed for several minutes while the group watched. The kidnapper finally explained the point of this clandestine encounter. I'm very sorry I had to frighten you with the mask and the gun, but I knew it was the only way to get you here. It was just too dangerous any other way. I apologize. But now my question is, will you teach us the Bible?